In this video, I'm going to go over e-waste. I'll cover what e-waste is and where it comes from, the problems it creates, and how we can prevent it. If you're like most people, you use electronics for at least a few hours each day. All of the electronics we use each day are eventually going to be replaced, may it be because they are broken or simply because we want to get a new one. When we throw away all of our old electronics, a huge amount of waste is generated known as e-waste or electronic waste. E-waste is the fastest growing source of waste in the world. In 2019, the world generated over 53 million tons of e-waste. To put this in perspective, the Titanic only weighed 52,000 tons. This means the world generates over 1,000 times the weight of the Titanic in e-waste each year. This is about 1.6 tons or over 3,000 pounds of e-waste each second, and this number is still growing. Of the 53 million tons of e-waste generated each year, only about 17% or 170 Titanic's worth of e-waste gets recycled, while the other 83% or 830 Titanic's of smartphones, refrigerators, dishwashers, laptops, coffee makers, TVs, and so on, ends up in landfills, incinerators, and elsewhere. There are two main concerns with all of this e-waste. The first is that e-waste has a negative impact on human and environmental health, and the other is the impact on resource availability. Now you might be wondering, how is it that my old smartphone or laptop causes human health or environmental damage? I mean, I do use it every day, and I even live with it, and I feel fine. So, why does disposing of it cause such big issues? Electronics contain more than 1,000 different substances, many of which are toxic. Among the many different substances are dozens of metals such as copper used for wire, aluminum for tubing in refrigerators, iron for motors, lithium in batteries, and many others such as zinc, nickel, and cobalt. Even gold can be found in circuit boards, and silver can be found in switches, for example, in microwaves. When our electronics become e-waste, they are often sent to incinerators where they are, well, incinerated. As e-waste and all of the metals and other substances are incinerated, highly hazardous pollutants are released into the atmosphere where they could have a negative impact on the health of the people living in the area. Most e-waste is sent to landfills, however, e-waste also poses an issue in landfills because the toxic materials and metals can break down and eventually make their way into the ground in nearby water and soil. Even recycling may not be the best option in all cases to handle e-waste. This is because recycling must be done properly. In many countries around the world, they don't have the proper tools or training to recycle e-waste and resort to methods like burning or using chemicals to try and get recyclable materials out of electronic waste. This puts e-waste workers directly at risk. So no matter the disposal path, if e-waste is not handled properly, it can negatively impact the local environment, including the surrounding people, air, water, and soil. So how does this impact you if you don't live near an e-waste disposal site or don't work at an e-waste disposal site? There is evidence that suggests that e-waste pollutants may make their way into agricultural and other products that are then exported around the world. So even though you may not live near an e-waste disposal site, you could be consuming products that come from areas near e-waste disposal sites that have been impacted by e-waste pollution. In addition, all of this wasted material was extracted, transported, processed, manufactured and shipped all over the world, which means greenhouse gases were generated which contributes to climate change. The other major concern with the mounting e-waste issue is just how much of our metal resources are being wasted and buried in landfills and burned up in incinerators each year. It's estimated that the value of the metals within e-waste that we throw away each year is about $62.5 billion. In fact, each year we throw away about 1.8 million tons of copper alone. This is enough copper for nearly 23 million electric cars each year. For reference, Tesla sold about 1 million electric cars in 2021, and worldwide there were about 6.5 million electric cars sold. So there is more than enough copper in our e-waste to meet our copper needs in creating electric vehicles for many years. In a world where there is a growing concern that we won't have enough metals to meet our needs, e-waste could be a promising source. And while the human, environmental, and economic impact of these lost metals is high, very little is actually recovered and recycled each year. According to certain studies, the vast majority of e-waste is generated from households instead of businesses. So we, everyday people, and not businesses or other commercial locations are generating this waste. And according to other studies, at least half of the e-waste generated in homes of most countries is the result of throwing away small and large appliances. Small appliances are electronics such as vacuum cleaners, microwaves, toasters, and cameras, while large appliances are things like washing machines, 
dryers, dishwashers, and electric stoves. Now, of course, the large appliances weigh significantly more than the small appliances. For example, a dishwasher weighs more than a toaster. In fact, it weighs about 20 times more. Interestingly, large appliances don't make up 20 times more waste than small appliances, even though they tend to weigh 20 times more. The remaining e-waste falls into four main categories. Cooling and freezing equipment, such as refrigerators and air conditionings, screens and monitors, for example, televisions, monitors, laptops, and tablets, lamps, and last, small IT and telecommunication equipment, for example, mobile phones, GPS devices, personal computers, printers, and telephones. So how can we use all of this information to improve the issue? Well, creating laws and policies is one suggestion, and in certain countries around the world, e-waste laws have improved the e-waste issue. However, right now, over 70% of the world's population already has some e-waste policy in place, which likely means that policy on e-waste is not effective enough on its own. Luckily, since most e-waste is produced in homes, this gives us the power to take action against e-waste ourselves. According to the waste hierarchy, the first step in reducing any type of waste is reduction. We can reduce the amount of e-waste produced by purchasing less products. We can also purchase better products that last longer, so we don't need to replace our old electronics as often. As possible, I'll keep the description updated with product recommendations that are built to last. So check that out as needed. The next level of the hierarchy is reuse. This means using something that has already been used. For example, borrowing from a friend or family or purchasing something online or from a thrift store. You can also donate, gift, or sell your used electronics to someone else. Again, I'll leave good sources for this in the description. Another way to reduce the need for new electronics and the creation of e-waste would be to fix broken electronics or outdated electronics. This can be difficult since many products are not made to be repaired anymore. However, right to repair policies are starting to pop up around the world, meaning product manufacturers need to do a better job at making their products repairable. Last, whatever cannot be reduced, reused, or repaired should be recycled. Recycling should be the last strategy used in the handling of e-waste, however, it's often the only strategy used if any is used at all. If you want to learn more about e-waste, check out the resources in the description, including our app. Otherwise, if you like this video, let me know by liking the video and subscribing to Go Green Post. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.